today we're gonna go over proper squat technique and where a lot of people kind of screw up on their squat and where they could be limited back squat form but primarily I do um, quite a bit of squatting with clients in a gauntlet position for a couple of reasons so one um, the barbell back squat in general requires a lot I mean like a lot of prerequisites in order to do it effectively and I would say 99% of the general population should not be barbell back squatting they have no business doing so I have yet to see a general population person do a good barbell back squat like the goblet squat is kind of where I start with so many people and the number one thing is that putting a dumbbell in this position this goblet position kind of self corrects a lot of things because if you think about it if I was holding a dumbbell like this and squatting down it would probably not feel really good to collapse here so automatically your body just wants to self correct and to be a more neutral position more of a joint centrated position and things kind of just fall in place where they should and say you know like I'm not bashing back squats it's just a lot can go wrong during a squat like that and you need a lot in order to do that and one of the prerequisites for strength I'm not gonna go into mobility yet for strength and I stole this from dr. John Russin is the goblet squat challenge so you would take 50% of your body weight in a dumbbell kettlebell form whatever it is and you're gonna try to squat that weight 25 repetitions it, that's fucking tough right so say you're a 200 pound person and you're holding a 100 pound dumbbell and you need to squat with good form 25 reps before you should start going into the barbell back squat. Like, I think that in itself is one of those great ways to kind of gauge. Cause like think about what is necessary in order to do a squat like that. Like that requires a lot of strength, a lot of endurance, a lot of core strength. Like a lot of the small foundational things that people tend to forget to develop they jump right into the back squat rather than actually being able to do something like that. Like my half of my body weight and did 25 reps. I'll be like, fuck, like my legs are done. Taking half of your body weight into a dumbbell and squatting and you realize that it's difficult. Why do you think placing a barbell on your back that's gonna have compressive forces and shear forces on your spine continually. And then on top of that, do form that's like mediocre that's not gonna help you down the line or, or anything really. And then I always ask this question, I'm like, okay, well, what's the goal behind you back squatting? Like, what are you trying to achieve? And a lot of times I just get a question, it's like, oh, I just wanna get strong legs. And I'm like, well, there's so many other ways that you could get strong legs without barbell back squatting. So I think a lot of times people kind of just assume because you're using a barbell, it's like, the pedestal of leg training exercises, but in reality, it's not. It's like, unless you're gonna be competing in powerlifting or Olympic weightlifting, then you don't really need to do it. If the goal is to get strong legs, better looking legs, like there's so many other exercises out there that will do its job. And on top of that, not have so much of a taxing force on your body and do more harm than good. So that's kind of my thought process behind the barbell back squat because now let's get into what's needed right so not only do you need strength and core stability hip stability shoulder stability all those things that kind of keep your body safe while doing the exercise but there's a lot of mobility requirements number one is your thoracic mobility if your t-spine which is up here can't effectively extend to place this barbell behind your back then already you're fucked <laughs> you're you're already like doing it wrong if you look at the general population like everyone has terrible t-spine mobility and now they're thinking like let's put a barbell on my back and hopefully hopefully like nothing fucks up but it does it does when you come down into your squat let's say i have my barbell behind and i come down like my torso needs to stay upright so if i have a t-spine that doesn't really extend that great i'm gonna kind of be here so like let's, let's take that mobility that an average person has and now i'm squatting down 
look at already what's happening with my spine and look at my lumbar spine like that does not look good so this is this is literally where people kind of stop in their squad they can do a quarter squat and then if they go any lower person with terrible t-spine mobility they kind of here they start squatting and then they get to here like that butt wink that people talk about happens a lot faster and it's already starting to go into play like forces are going to places where they shouldn't right and i'm not saying like that rep that you just did is the one that's gonna destroy your spine but it's the repetitive nature of it right like it's just like if someone's going to go bend it down to pick up their kids or super rounded it's not that one thing it's like the repetitive motion of it so that's one thing in order to effectively back squat to have the barbell in a biomechanically like a biomechanically advantage position you need t-spine mobility so that's number one number two shoulder mobility so in order to take this barbell that's in front of you in the squat rack and place it behind you and effectively create tension like that's the other thing too is like when i talk to general pop uh, about back squatting the first question goes like how do you create tension and they're just like they look at me like i'm speaking a different language and i'm like okay if this person doesn't understand the concept of creating tension creating intra-abdominal pressure in order to successfully go through this movement without energy leaks or again things going through places that are not supposed to then they're already at a disadvantage and on top of that they're already with limited t-spine mobility like things are now just spiraling out of control without them even knowing so in order to create tension with a barbell on a back squat is if you were grabbing this guy and i have it behind my back and i'm pulling down into my traps so the moment i pull down like think of a lap pull down like you're getting all this stuff to create tension for you right so if i now have terrible t-spine mobility and i'm trying to take the barbell what's going to happen is a perfect scenario is if i pull down my elbows stay tight and then this kind of tight position will get those lats engaged but if i don't have t-spine or shoulder mobility what happens is if i'm on a side view what you'll see is these like chicken wing arms like people's back squat tends to look like this right this is the typical position that everyone kind of falls into when they don't have those prerequisites now there's no way for you to create tension in that way just the design of like your shoulder being in this position trying to like pull down like it's not going to happen so now say i am average joe back squatting grab the barbell i'm already in this random shoulder position and i'm like this like this is how the squat's going to look at a quarter and then going any further things again are starting to fall apart. That was two things only. <laughs> what do most general population people have? That's another issue. Tight hips and you're trying to squat. If you have tight hips, it's not gonna really happen. It's gonna be like a square and around, a square peg in a round hole constantly trying to get through. So a lot of people end up doing quarter squats and they're just like jamming their femur into their hip uh, socket and you're just like grinding shit in places that it shouldn't be in. Fourth thing you need, actually I'm gonna go back to the third thing with the hips. So what happens is that if your hip joints don't move the way they should, your body's gonna find mobility elsewhere. And it's usually a place that doesn't need to be mobile, AKA your lower back. So what happens is your lower back takes over for the lack there of hip mobility. And now the low back is now starting to act like a mobile joint. And over time, that lower back's not gonna be happy. So that's one of the biggest things. You see this in deadlifts and squats. One of the biggest complaints is low back pain. Number four, tibial rotation. Your tibia, which is this giant bone in your shin, when you squat, it needs to be able to externally rotate. Your knee joint, where you have your bone that literally goes in there, it allows it to rotate. And so this is my right side, so I can rotate to the right. So in my kid stretch class, when we do knee cars, I'm literally trying to get people to think about, you know, if I lock out my ankle, so now I'm not using my ankle joint like I'm doing ankle circles or anything like that. If I lock it out and try to rotate my foot to the right as far as possible, this just moved. So if you look at my shin, I'm literally going to external rotation. And I can also go to internal rotation a little bit. So back and forth, this tibia gets to move. So if I literally like 
pinpoint my tibia and I squeeze down on my hand and I start rotating my foot out and you can see where my thumb is pointing is actually rotating to the right. This is a normal um, amount of tibial rotation for somebody. A lot of times when people are trying to squat, they're having a rough time getting down there. Usually when, you, when I assess the person's tibia, they can't rotate this guy. So what happens is now again, sheer forces are going to places where it shouldn't because like having adequate tibial rotation allows you to kind of disperse force through it. And if that doesn't happen, it kind of gets stuck in the hip and people start getting painful, uh, a painful hip joint because it's taking up all the, the work. One, that's number four, is if this tibia can't move properly, then it's not, you're not ever going to squat the greatest, right? So a lot of times, like, people just need to go back to the basics. And this is where, you know, my new joke now is like, hey, I have this thing in my body. It's my knee, my ankle, my wrist, my elbow, my shoulder, my hip, whatever joint, whatever muscle it is. They're like, what should I do on my kin stretch? Like kin stretch will literally fix everything because we need to influence tissue change at a joint or at a certain muscle that's not moving the way it should. So let's influence better tissues, better, like smarter tissue, right? So um, kin stretch can fix all that. Now, the other component to squatting effectively is your ankle joint. I've literally done this ankle needs to have adequate dorsiflexion. So if I drive my knee forward, it needs to go pretty far. I'm gonna kind of move my arm in order for me to squat. A lot of people have tight ankles and they get to a certain point and they get stuck and now they can't effectively squat in their back squat, golf squat, whatever it is, and things kind of fall apart. So that being said, we have now, what well, we said, T-spine, shoulder, hip, tibia, and ankle. Five things. Five things in order to effectively squat. And most of the time, when I get people working with me and I assess them, all five things don't move the way they should. And then they're complaining that they're getting pain in X, Y, and Z when they back squat. And I'm like, well, no wonder, <laughs> right? Like that makes sense to me. So I try to make the compromise of let's gobble squat heavy to supplement that back squat. Right away, they see a huge change in how, they jo how their joints feel. So the goblet squat is one of those things that I always move to and there's lots of ways to make it challenging. Say if you're a gym bro that's been back squatting forever but it's been effing up your body and you're like at that point where like, okay, I will do your goblet squat. And I always make this joke slash statement like I can take the strongest guy at our gym, give him the 100 pound dumbbell in a goblet position and tell him for five reps, you're gonna goblet squat. But what I wanna see is you're gonna eccentrically load, so going down slowly, for five Mississippis. And then at the bottom of your squad, you're gonna hold it for another five Mississippis. And then when you go up, I want you to go as fast as possible. And that's one rep. Do four more after. That will destroy him. Destroy that guy. And that's when I can convince people that, holy shit, this is a lot harder than slapping 225, doing quarter squats with terrible biomechanics. Like you're gonna get more out of that than forcing a square peg in a round hole constantly. We're gonna go into how I coach the goblet squat and what I wanna see. With the goblet squat, typically, and this goes down to anatomy too, everyone's hips are different. And I always have this discussion with everyone. A more narrow stance with your heels and a more outwardly rotated forefoot with the knees tracking over it, tends to work better for most people compared to like, oh, hip width apart, toes straight, whatever it is. So when I get people squatting, like I said, a more narrow stance closer with the heels, with the toes out, with the knees tracking on the outside. It tends to work a little bit better. Why? Most general pop, their hips have adapted to their sitting quite a bit. And in my experience in the gym and clinic, that squat stance tends to work a lot. Generally speaking, that's what tends to work. So in that squat position, a more narrow stance with the heels, toes out a little bit more. And this is the thing is I want people to think of having their knees constantly follow where the toes are. 
and that's going to engage all these hips, uh, hip lateral stabilizers in the squat. Because the worst thing is when people start squatting and their knees kind of buckle in and then they come back up. And that's another reason why I don't like um, having the toes forward, which a lot of people tend to fall into that category because that's what they were told. But if you're that person that has limited ankle mobility and tibial rotation, that's not gonna help. And you're gonna end up looking like this in your squat. And that's like a deadlift. We don't want a deadlift. So if you think about it, if you're that person with tight ankles and tight and limited range of motion in your tibia, then this position here where one, you're tracking your knees out, which is gonna already allow your tibia to go out. You're pushing your knees out, which is gonna externally rotate your hips to give you more mobility because a lot of people lack internal rotation. And now you're also allowing to utilize more of a vertical shin angle which requires less of dorsiflexion. So we're covering already three things for a better squat of the five that we spoke earlier. And this is why it tends to work a lot. In that goblet position, with that foot position that we're in, and we're squatting to about parallel, whatever you can do. And if I'm holding a dumbbell here, like I was talking about earlier, how it's more of a self-correcting exercise. It teaches you how to extend through the spine. And now we don't have to worry about um, shoulder mobility to get that barbell behind our back. So now we've literally covered all five issues in what we spoke about earlier to get that squat looking better. Now that we are biomechanically at an advantage with all those things, we're good to go. Let's load and now let's fuck some shit up. That's what I always say. And the other things too, to create that tension, all kind of starts with your feet. So if you think of like a ground up approach, when I'm getting people to um, squat, as they're pushing their knees out, I'm trying to push their feet out without like rolling their ankle over. So the moment, like even if you stand and you just think about, I'm gonna push my feet out, you feel these lateral stabilizers turn on right away. You're creating tension. So if I'm doing that position, pushing out, I'm creating a lot of good tension. And as I'm coming down in my squat, I'm taking a big intra-abdominal uh, breath in my belly. So if I took a deep breath in, big round belly and hold as I come down. And then I'm exhaling as hard as possible and then locking out my glutes at the top. And then the other way to create tension that I really, really, really like is utilizing the piece of equipment. So if I'm holding the dumbbell, I'm thinking of like, squeezing that thing and also hiding the armpits. What I mean by that is a lot of times when people go into goblet position, they're kind of already in this round position. But if I tell you to hide your armpits, people fall into this position. Now I'm kind of packing that shoulder, getting my lats engaged and I have a better way to create tension. So now I have tension creating in my feet, in my knees, in my hips, in my core, in my hands. And I'm also doing that into getting into more T-spine extension and better uh, shoulder stability. So five biomechan biomechanical advantages already covered. We've already created tension. We already covered our breath. Like Again, these are a lot of th things to remember and it can be overwhelming for someone new, but these are the things that I slowly start implementing one thing at a time. So then when we do get to a point with my client where I'm like, okay, Here's the 60 pound dumbbell. They're ready, they're well equipped and they can fucking crush it. They do their first set and then they're like, crap, I can't believe I did that. And I'm like, yeah, we freaking worked up to it, right? So it's those small things that add up over time. But a lot of people always wanna skip. They always wanna skip steps. I don't understand. That's like you trying to bake something and you're like, fuck step three. I'm just gonna go to step number five put this bitch in the oven and hopefully it turns out like, no, like everyone knows that's so stupid, but in exercise for some reason, it's like, no, I don't need to do dumbbell squats. I'm just gonna go right to the barbell because everyone else is doing it and that looks fucking cool. Like, no, because at the end of the day, we all wanna move better, feel better and get stronger. Like you gotta match up the exercises to your goals. So I'm gonna leave it there. This gave you a lot of information a lot of visual cues, a lot of things to think about when you're squatting, and hopefully I convince you to actually stop back squatting a little bit. There you have it. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out, subscribe to my channel, so then you get updates anytime I post a new one. Also add me on Facebook and Instagram, because I post again a lot of videos and photos and things like that, of a lot of content, and please reach out. Like, 
I post a lot of stuff. I love answering questions. I'm getting a lot of rehab specific questions right now. And for those who don't know, who are like, I just found you, Raph, like you're pretty good at what you do. I've been working at a chiropractic clinic for three years now, working with almost every single patient coming in. I have seen a lot of injuries. I've worked with a lot of injuries. I've worked on some really weird cases and applied my knowledge of exercise for these people. And I've seen great results, both on the manual therapy side and on the exercise therapy ser therapy side, blending together. And I can definitely, definitely help you if you are frustrated, because I we get a lot of patients that have been seeing physio or chiro for two years from a car accident and nothing's getting better and they come see us and they're like, holy shit, why didn't I do this in the very beginning? So feel free to reach out if you're like, yeah, so my shoulder thing, and I had surgery and it didn't really heal. Like I have ideas that can help. And if not, I can refer you to someone in the industry because I have quite a big extensive network across the world as great strength coaches and practitioners that can help. So feel free to reach out. That's it for me. Till next time, you guys.